Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us back for the for the uh, Aotrauma North America Pelvic Acetabular Fracture Management Essentials course. Um, this is uh, you know, tonight's session is a continuation from last Saturday's uh, session. Those of you who uh, who didn't get a chance to to sign on, we were doing uh, case presentations with a faculty panel, and we're going to continue that tonight with uh, some more complicated cases. I'm joined tonight by uh, Dave Stephen and Steve Sims, uh, they, and we're co-chairing this event. Uh, and as you've heard every week, uh, this uh, this concept of a hybrid uh, course um, was modeled after other successful courses like the AO Trauma North America Osteotomy course. And uh, the idea was that there would be a, a cadaver session uh, to uh, go along with this, um, and that was to be at the Equendo Center in Las Vegas. It's unclear that that portion will happen, um, but um, most likely there will be a um, in-person uh, AO Trauma North America pelvic course uh, in the future, and um, we're trying to figure out ways to have the uh, cadaver uh, portion of this course available to those of you who participated uh, this uh, in this <clears throat> essentials course. Uh, but more information will come as uh, the pandemic continues to uh, develop and we continue to respond. So you can see the course faculty that has been joining us uh, week after week for the last uh, eight weeks. and. Uh, Tonight's uh, faculty for the panel discussions uh, we see here with uh, Dr. John Eastman from UC Davis, Eric Johnson from UCLA, Philip Krieger from Nashville, Keith Mayo um, from uh, Seattle, Kevin Phelps from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Mike Stover uh, from Northwestern in Chicago. Their disclosures are here um, and uh, available for you to review if you wish. Uh, all of your microphones uh, are muted and videos are turned off. Uh, we ask that you use the question and answer section uh, for uh, questions related to the cases that we're going to be discuss discussing tonight. Uh, please do not use the chat function as the faculty will be using the chat uh, function uh, to be able to communicate back and forth uh, during the session. Um, Dr. Steven and uh, Dr. Sims will be uh, taking a look at the, the questions that you type and either uh, answering some of them or presenting them to the uh, faculty uh, for, uh, for them to answer uh, in relation to their cases. You'll also receive a link to the, this recording, which will be sent out 24 hours from now, after, um, which um, will allow you to access tonight's uh, and all of the uh, previous uh, sessions. Uh, and that will be on the AO Trauma North America YouTube channel uh, available for you to see at any point. So this is our uh, second of the acetabular fracture case management um, discussion groups or expert panel discussions. Um, and uh, of course, we hope that you'll join us for the conclusion of this uh, essentials course um, this Saturday when we uh, discuss particular special problems uh, and complications and uh, conclude, um, and conclude the course on Saturday. So uh, if the uh, faculty wouldn't mind um, turning their cameras on for just a second, the, the faculty panel tonight, um, Dr. Stover is going to get ready to present our first case, but uh, before we do, there um, were questions that were submitted as part of the homework uh, session, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that those uh, got addressed to the to the faculty. Um, Phil, I think you presented the transverse fracture case uh, on a Saturday, and so we had a question from a participant asking for any particular tips and tricks about uh, placing clamps through the greater sciatic notch for transverse fractures when operating in the lateral position through a lateral Coker-Langenbeck. Your thoughts maybe for, the, for that gentleman? Yeah, I think the, the first thing that one wants, whether you're lateral or prone, one wants to relax the sciatic nerve. So that's gonna be 
uh, hip extension and knee flexion and whether you're prone or lateral you want to have that done the second thing is you really want to know where the sciatic nerve uh, is uh, the third is you really uh, generally will palpate the fracture first with the finger um, so I'll usually take my index finger of my opposite I'm right-handed so I'll use my left hand and uh, palpate where I want to uh, place the clamp. Usually it's a short angle jaw or perhaps a um, asymmetrical uh, rebruge clamp uh, through the greater sciatic notch. And I think the, the uh, other point that I would make is you want to elevate the gluteus minimus up from the outer aspect of the innominate bone so that the uh, outer tongue, if you will, is uh, on bone and not going through the gluteus minimus. Now, having said all that, I think those are, those are uh, the same whether or not you're doing it in the prone or lateral approach. Uh, personally, I think one of the really big uh, advantages of the prone approach is an easier um, palpation of the fracture through the greater sciatic notch and indeed also easier to put a clamp through the notch uh, onto the fracture in the prone position. And I find, especially if the body habitus is relatively large, my ability to really get the clamp through the greater sciatic notch and onto the anterior column can be challenging. So I think, I don't think there's anything unique to either the prone or lateral position. Uh, I, I do think that the prone position is easier for placement of the clamp. Any of the faculty have any experience with any type of positioning uh, in the lateral position that affects your ability to work through the notch more or less, say a beanbag or lower profile rolls or a hip positioner? Or is there is there one thing to either favor or try and avoid? Not so much. It seems to me like sometimes a beanbag tends to be up a little bit higher, takes up a little bit more room, pushes the buttock uh, maybe a little bit more. And uh, so a lower profile roll sometimes can um, maybe stay out of the way a little bit more. But, um, John Eastman, uh, there was a, a question. It's not really applicable per se to, to your case, but there was a question about um, bowel gas obscuring your ability to image the pelvic ring for iliosacral or um, transsacral screws. And the, the questions were, do you do anything in particular to uh, ahead of time to prep the bowel? And uh, what do you do if you find that out in the operating room or when, you know, what do you do to determine whether or not you're gonna be able to image the patient appropriately? Um, it's a great question, a big problem. I think we haven't had a, a whole lot of problems, but I think all those things can exist. And then if you add in an elderly patient with osteoporotic bones, it makes it even more challenging. Um, and so I think we try to get to, to most injuries as soon as we can. So hopefully there's not a big backup of bowel gas in terms of people on narcotics and immobility. They can have big ileus and, and uh, it can be a bigger problem. So hopefully sooner the better. Um, and depending on what level of screw I'm trying to do, we'll try to get optimal views. And sometimes we'll kind of cant around bowel gas. And so instead of being a direct AP, maybe it's five or seven degrees off axis, just to try to make sure you can see that, that is, that's indeed the frame you're trying to see instead of uh, you know, maybe some sort of shadow. Uh, I don't routinely do any sort of bowel prep um, and I haven't really had a problem. I think there are uh, indications for navigation that some people talk about. I just haven't had that need or seen that problem. And actually, we don't have that capacity, but um, I think it's also a possibility. Other comments from the faculty? I think the other thing to, to remember is that the one view that's um, less affected or unaffected by bowel gas is the lateral. You're probably not going to do all of your work with just a lateral, but the lateral view tends to um, be completely free of the bowel gas shadows, which is which can be kind of nice. Uh, there was one last question about non-operative management. So we've had, you know, I think it, it applies mostly to, to pelvic ring in the, in the question, but um, whether it be pelvic ring fractures or whether it be the acetabular fractures, we talked about the possibility of non-operative management last week. Um, 
the surgeon wanted to know, does non-operative management mean bed rest? Does it mean traction? Does it mean get the patient up and mobilize them? And do you restrict weight bearing? Any thoughts, maybe Keith? Yeah, I think it, it really depends on, on the injury. I mean, if you're looking at a, a, a number of unstable lateral compression sacral fractures, which are statistically the most common, then based on the papers that you and Sims, uh, Steve have written, I think we should get them up and let them uh, wait there. In general, if you make the decision to treat somebody non-operatively, uh, it's because you either think the patient is incapable of withstanding surgery or they have a stable injury and those are completely different scenarios. So a stable injury, obviously you let weight bear immediately uh, and then check to make sure that you were correct in that assessment. And then the unstable injury and the um, difficult or non-surgical candidate is a much bigger problem because those are the worst candidates for bed rest. And you have to do those case by case. So in general, and that's the same is true for the acetabulum, is that if you decide on operative management, then the only good side of that is being able to mobilize the patient and then deal with the deformity later. Great. Just over, you want to, uh, you want to share your screen? Okay. So we're going to go over a uh, specific fracture type that we can cover. Uh, this is a 20-year-old female who was injured back in 2016 restrained, uh, loss of consciousness, no recollection of the specific events of the accident. And then she was transferred to our facility for further care. Uh, she's a relatively small lady, healthy, no other associated uh, comorbidities. She has uh, really no uh, associated injuries with this. The head injury was rather brief and uh, resolved. So this is her AP pelvis x-ray. As you can see, she's got disruption of the iliopectineal and ilioischial line. And you can see that these are uh, disrupted in continuity up here near the greater sciatic notch. There's no specific fracture line through the weight bearing surface. And there's a fracture line going up through the uh, iliac crest. You don't really see a displacement of the uh, ischium or there's no displaced fracture of the ischial ramus and there's a little bit of a subluxation of the pubic symphysis. Okay. On the uh, obturator oblique, you can see that the entirety of the joint is medialized. The uh, disruption of the uh, iliopectineal line or the anterior border of the bone is very high. Uh, you can see here is a specific uh, spur sign. And on the iliac oblique, the fracture through the ilium, through the uh, weight bearing portion of the joint is visualized and the displacement of the posterior border of the bone and the greater sciatic notch. So the CT scan was obtained and this will show you the uh, fractures of the anterior column, you can see that showing up there. Some fragmentation along the quadrilateral sur I'm sorry, along the uh, pelvic brim. The fracture as it approximates or goes into the SI joint. And then the posterior column fracture there and the relatively simple split through the weight bearing surface of the acetabulum. This is the three-dimensional reconstructions that were obtained. So you can see here's the fracture lines of the, of the acetabulum. There's the anterior column that's pretty easily visualized. You'll see in the gap, there's the fragmentation that occurred on the compression side of the fracture. There's the intact ilium, the simple fracture through the posterior column at the rim. You'll take note here that there's minimal displacement at the rim consistent with maintenance of the capsule labral uh, junction, uh, which can facilitate reduction. You can see that the fracture is very high on the internal aspect of the, uh, acid, of the uh, bone. And you can see that it enters the SI joint right here. Uh, 
And this is actually the anterior part of the uh, SI joint of the intact ilium. So her diagnosis is an associated both column tabular fracture with SI joint involvement. Uh, the question is, do you need any additional workup and what would be the surgical plan for this specific fracture? Do you want me to move forward, Mark? Yeah, I think, I think so. Okay, so these are the specific views that we're looking at. And the complicating factor is the fact that the fracture enters the sacroiliac joint and you're really not gonna get a very good visualization of the majority of the fracture through the ilioinguinal approach. And also this fragmentation from the uh, compression side of the outer aspect of the ilium that is uh, displaced into the internal aspect of the pelvis. Uh, and then your question is, do you do a much bigger approach uh, to put together such a simple fracture line or do you do a less limit or a more limited approach and accept maybe some secondary surgical congruence at the joint? So Mike, do you think if we go back to that back uh, one slide? Yes. Um, so that CT obviously is done in uh, with the head significantly medialized. You think if the head was uh, in a more lateralized position, any of those would improve their position and maybe change your decision making? I don't know. If you look here, I think some of them are actually trapped on the inside of the intact ilium on the uh, on the uh, iliac oblique that you see the, on the three dimensional reconstruction. So these are actually trapped inside of the intact ilium, which right. is also like possibly complicated. complicated. Excuse me. It seems like the posterior column could be incarcerated on the front of the sacrum. Yeah. So it's so that would be the challenge of what you could do from an ilioinguinal approach, because the vast majority of these fractures are treated through the ilioinguinal. Um, and I chose a lateral position, extended iliofemoral. I waited a couple of days for the flap to calm down, and we did it with uh, not too much blood loss. But so the question is why not do it through the ilioinguinal, I guess. And if you look at the, the bone here, this would be your visualization on the internal aspect of the uh, pelvis. So through the lateral window, you'd be able to see the fracture confluence right there, but you really wouldn't be able to follow the fracture of the posterior column uh, down in along the uh, quadrilateral surface or into the greater notch because it would disappear into the SI joint where with approach to the outer aspect of the bone, you'd see that you'd be able to retrieve the fragmentation and you could make these simple fracture lines actually quite uh, easily, or you could easily reduce these uh, simple fracture lines on the outer aspect of the bone. And I don't really think you need to, but you could also have access to the joint for visualization of your reduction. Could, uh, could I ask Keith a question? Sure. Keith? Keith, do you think, go back, do you think that the uh, extended ilioinguinal, um, as, as described by uh, Jeff and, and Reinhold, would be an option here? And this is really not a good pattern for that um, because the anterior extent of the posterior exposure really is the posterior border, the medius pillar. So you'd be right at the very limit without the, any, any ability to actually key in those fragments. So it's much better for the unstable inferior part of the sacroiliac joint or a, a portion of the greater sciatic notch, which extends up into the inferior portion of the joint that you can't see. You know, I, I would, in a situation like this, I always really wondered with these relatively simple articular patterns in both columns, why, and I, I've tried it actually, and now I know why, but why we can't approach it like we would approach a plateau. And that is, um, we basically put the joint together first and then reattach that to the metaphysis or diaphysis. And so I think I would have been tempted to try to get a picture of this in traction, probably in a lot of traction. And you know, I, I've never been able to execute it, but I have tried on several occasions to distract as much as possible and then try to get the anterior posterior columns reduced 
And then I'd be just left with a transiliac disruption and then reattach the joint to the anometer bone. I've come close several times, but I've never really made it. So, and I mean, I think that's the question a lot of people have. I mean, we don't address pylons or plateaus or distal femurs this way. And that's largely because those are direct articular reductions as opposed to these being indirect. But if we had the ability to do an indirect reduction, which was anatomic by creating space between the intact and dominant bone in our two columns, uh, it's an in intriguing possibility. So do you think if there were rami fractures, either right or bilaterally, um, that that would be enough mobility to allow you to pursue that strategy? Um, I think that on the ipsilateral side, it might help. I think on the contralateral side, my, my experience is that they almost always make things worse. Uh, Mike, there was a question from a participant uh, asking why you couldn't do this through an AIP approach. Maybe go backward to that, uh, to the view of the inside of the pelvis. Yeah, I think this would be the most challenging part from the AIP is that if you get to this portion from here, I think you could maybe see the back side of this fracture. This disappears over the front pretty early and this access would be kind of challenging. You'd have to have the lateral window along with it. And really the only benefit of the AIP would be to apply fixation, uh, but really not assess the fracture. Uh, any, other, any other questions from, or any other points from the, the faculty? Would anybody have tried this through an ilioinguinal? Phil or John? No, I, I tried this maybe uh, 20 years ago before I had the wisdom that was elucidated tonight. And um, you can never really get it uh, perfect. So I think that's, that's the problem that's already been discussed. So I generally wouldn't, wouldn't try it in this particular pattern. Yeah, I think at best you'll end up with a surgical secondary congruence, but at worst, you'll you know you'll find that you can't get the posterior column reduced and then you're not going to want to reduce the anterior column because you're going to lose all of your options all right mike so uh so you chose lateral position and an extended approach we saw correct and so here's our what immediate was your, what was your sequence of reduction what's that what was your sequence for reduction okay the sequence uh for the reduction I'm going to go back a couple of slides and just to look at the 3D. The sequence of the reduction, um, let me see if I can find the lateral aspect of the bone right here, Mark, sorry. So the sequence would be to reduce the anterior column to the intact ilium and then the posterior column to the confluence of the intact ilium and the anterior column. So you would start with your reduction here, attraction, of course, as Keith pointed out, reduction at the crest, reduction along the outer aspect of the bone here. Uh, you'll see there's a couple of mini fragment screws that I placed these fragments back along the obliquity of their fracture lines to help get this read and then reduce the posterior column to that. And just a two screw technique to distract the anterior column and disimpact uh, from the front of the sacrum? Yes. So here's the post-operative x-rays. So immediate post-op plan for me is I drain the flap always with the extended iliofemoral uh, until the, the fluid levels are quite low, actually less than 30 a shift. I keep them in bed for 36 hours with an abduction pill to allow the flap to calm down. Use endomethacin for three weeks for heterotopic ossification prophylaxis, Lovenox, three weeks transitioning to aspirin. 30 pound weight bearing or 15 kilo weight bearing heel toe gait uh, for eight, at least eight weeks, but with the big fragments, probably eight weeks is sufficient. And no active abduction, no passive adduction due to the trochanteric uh, osteotomy for the uh, mobilization of the gluteus medius. 
And so is here the patient is it different than the trochanteric osteotomy we discussed with the Gibson and the Coker? Um, no, it's it's like the one that I showed in my talk a week ago. So you'll take the minimus off uh, of the anterior aspect of the trochanter, tag that, and then you'll cut a uh, lateral to the piriformis, much like the uh, surgical dislocation. But you will have to detach distally the uh, insertion of the vastus lateralis to mobilize that unless you could take it off it's a very long sleeve but i've i've just taken it off at the vastus ridge personally so this is the patient at two-year follow-up maintained reduction and actually excellent functioning hip back in college with no complaints and actually back to sports so thank you yeah, that's a great case. Uh, so while um, Kevin Phelps is bringing up his case, uh, Steve or, or uh, Dave, any uh, any other questions from the participants that you want to send Mike's way? Yeah, I'll ask a question, uh, Michael. Uh, Mike, the uh, question came up uh, about the superior gluteal vessel. Uh, do you do anything to assess that preoperatively um, and or and or intraoperatively and does that change your approach? Um, I haven't done it preoperatively. Uh, I think what you taught me 25 years ago or whatever, so we're quite old now, is that uh, before you take down the ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex vessels is to check the pulse in the flap posteriorly. So when you elevate the abductors, off of the iliac crest uh, and you get down to the uh, apex of the greater cytic notch, you can check for a pulse or a Doppler pulse in the superior gluteal uh, with the thought that uh, you may want to maintain the ascending branch lateral femoral circumflex uh, as this can help feed some of the flap if the superior gluteal artery is down. Great. All right, Kevin, why not uh, take it away? Everybody see my screen okay? Yep. Uh, I want to just start off by thanking the uh, AO for uh, having me be part of this course and uh, present a case tonight. So um, educational pearls that I want to make sure we cover and you're thinking about as we go through this case. Um, I want you to think about strategic sequencing. I want you to make sure you're thinking ahead um, when you're doing some of these more complex cases. Um, you want to make sure you don't compromise um, future uh, your future fixation, um, especially when you have more complex injuries. And then those injuries that are more unstable typically require more fixation. So keep that in mind. So our patient we're going to go through is a 55 year old male. Um, he was involved in a four story fall um, out of a window. Um, he presented and had a rather isolated orthopedic injuries initially. He had a rib, some rib fractures, had a right, um, pretty bad bicondyl tibial plateau fracture, then also presented um, with this AP pelvis. Um, he was hemodynamically stable on arrival. Uh, he was awake, but altered. I mean, he was a little bit confused on presentation. Um, he was initially admitted to the ICU, but he was cleared for surgery the following day, um, again, with isolated orthopedic injuries. And you can see on this AP pelvis that um, he has an obvious right acetabular fracture. You can see a large, um, what appears to be an anterior column component um, that exits uh, quite high posteriorly. Um, you can see disruption of the ilioischial and iliopectinal lines. And you can also see some, some cranial displacement of his uh, right hemipelvis if you look closely. And he's also got a fracture of his inferior ramus. And these are the iliac oblique and obturator oblique views. Um, you can again see in the bottom left-hand corner um, um, his anterior column component that exits high and posterior. Um, you see the um, um, fractures of the inferior ramus, um, some comminution associated um, with the anterior column and the inferior, inferior ramus. Can't really appreciate um, any uh, posterior wall involvement on this image. You can also see um, basically directly down the, the, uh, the fracture plane um, of the sacral fracture on the right side. And then on the iliac oblique, you can again see the displacement of the anterior column. Um, it's a little bit difficult to appreciate the posterior column fracture as it's obscured by the, the Foley balloon as well as some residual contrast in the bladder, but you can also just see the displacement of the hip. Here are inlet and outlet views um, that further characterize the, the pelvic ring component of the injury. Um, if you look closely, you can see the, the vertical displacement of the right hemipelvis. Um, in addition to the acetabular fracture, you can see the cranial aspect of the sacrum here on the right, um, on the right side compared to that on the left side. You can also look at the caudal facet um, on the right side compared to that on the left side. 
and you can see some posterior translation of the right hemipelvis as well in the inlet um, when you compare it to the, um, to the contralateral side. Um, so the patient was initially put in traction um, given the, the cranial displacement of his right hemipelvis, um, which uh, helped his reduction of both his acetabulum and his, uh, and his sacral fracture. So then we obtained a CT scan um, to further characterize his injury. So as we go through it, you can see the exit point of the, um, of the high and posterior um, anterior column fracture. You can see his zone two sacral fracture on the right with uh, some um, rather significant comminution um, as we go down. And as we travel more caudal, you follow the anterior column fracture line down to the dome of the acetabulum. And then you can also see um, a small non-displaced or minimally displaced posterior wall component as well. And then you can appreciate the associated co comminution anteriorly, and then also the inferior ramus fracture. So we go to the 3D reconstruction images. This just gives you a better idea of the morphology, the, the fracture pattern. You see the anterior column component. You can see the, the, the poster wall that's minimally displaced. You can see the orientation of the, uh, the posterior column fracture that exits uh, ca um, fairly caudally just on the cranial aspect of the ischial spine. You can see the displacement of the sacral fracture with the associated comminution. You can also appreciate the transverse process fractures um, of the lumbar spine, um, signifying um, a rather significant disruption and a, a very, very high energy injury. And these are just the inlet um, and outlet and AP views of the 3D reconstructions um, of this injury. I'm just showing what we've already gone over, the, the cranial displacement of the right hemipelvis, associated transverse process fractures on the right, and also the both column, associated both column acetabular fracture on the right side. So I thought this might be a good time to, to open the, the, the floor up for discussion, um, get other faculty's thoughts on this type of injury. Um, specific questions I had thought about um, when looking at this case were one, how to sequence this and uh, what approach and or approach is to use um, in order to treat these in this combination of injuries. Um, is the sacrum something you do open or, or do a closed reduction? Um, is, is the poster wall something that might need to be addressed? And then how much fixation do we actually need for something like this um, for both the acetabulum and the sacrum? So if anybody has any thoughts. Yeah, why don't we start with Mike Stover. Mike, what do you think? Comminuted sacral fracture and then this uh, associated both column, it's lateral. Uh, the concern is just how well you can reduce the sacrum because the, that's going to set everything in place as you move forward with your anterior column and then finally your posterior column. Uh, but unlike other fracture types, you're not going to have the ability to to just clamp your sacrum and then maybe play with your acetabular fracture for a little bit and adjust it if needed. So I would probably start prone, go posterior, um, and uh, reduce the uh, sacrum. Uh, with zone two sacral fractures with bone quality and high energy like this, I commonly will use also uh, spinal pelvic fixation which may not be a bad idea because you're going to really start to bring the anterior column back to the intact ilium, which will take some force and it may have some challenges with your iliosacral screw fixation alone. Uh, and then assess whether or not you can reduce the posterior column, posterior wall uh, through the ilioinguinal as your, with your second stage being the ilioinguinal, and then if you can't, then you might have to even go back to a coker Langenbach. So if you anticipate a significant difficulty with assessing and obtaining an accurate reduction of the sacrum in something like this, um, do you think there's enough slop, if you will, through the comminuted rami fractures that you could, um, you could make up for a slight malreduction of the sacrum, but still be able to get the associated both column? Well, that's what you're hoping for, but the, the problem is really going to be with the posterior column when it comes down to it. 
and uh, you know that's going to not really the Ramai aren't really going to come into play uh, if you set your sacrum, go ilu inguinal, put your anterior column in place, and then you're going to have a challenge if you're off with the posterior column component, especially with that wall trying to key it in. Uh, and I think that's where your challenge will be. Keith, do you think this is an associated both column that you could reduce in isolation of the sacral fraction? Oh, that's what I'm hoping. It's a relatively straightforward uh, articular injury, or it seems to be. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the traction film, <clears throat> excuse me, looks promising. Um, but I'd certainly start anterior, I think, and try to reduce the anterior column back to the intact and dominant bone. And then if things were going well, and I thought I had a really good reduction of posterior column, which I think is unlikely in this setting, but possible. And I'd continue, and then this would be the rare exception because of the factors that Mike's already talked about, where I'd do the sacrum last. Otherwise, I'd do the anterior column first, hopefully, and then go prone so I'd have simultaneous access to the posterior column and sacrum at the same time. How many times in your career have you have you uh, kind of put together a floating acetabulum with a unstable posterior ring injury? I mean, successfully. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would be where I'm going, but yeah, yeah. Well, I hope springs eternal. Um, I haven't done it yet. I've had to bail, but um, at least conceptually, it makes sense. I think starting with the anterior column um, is a reasonable first step. So just to, for the participants to, to clarify, because we've, we've told them that you, you rarely get into trouble by starting with the reduction of the posterior pelvic ring. And in fact, that's our, the preference would be to start with the reduction of the posterior pelvic ring. Why in this case are we saying not to? I think it just has to do with the fact that because of the zone two comminution, um, you might be close, but you might be still have a significant malreduction. And if, if then the intact anominate bone is malpositioned relative to the anterior and posterior columns, then you have an obligatory uh, default to, if you're lucky, surgical secondary congruence, which is probably where you're going anyway. Um, but um, I, this sacral fracture, I think, is beyond my ability to get anatomic. I think your other option could be just to use iliosacral screws initially to approximate a reduction, give you some stability. And then if you're having trouble with the posterior column, you could, even, you could start supine with it. But if you had trouble with the posterior column, then you could flip, do it in two stages, anterior with iliosacral screw fixation, of the sacrum, uh, put your anterior column back together. If you have trouble with the posterior column or you don't like your reduction, then you could go prone for your second approach. You could take your screws out. You could adjust the sacral fracture at the same time as you adjust the posterior column through the uh, simultaneous posterior approach to the pelvis and the coker Langenbach. All right, Kevin, why don't you take us forward? I, mean, I think all those are great comments and all those are um, things that I thought about with this case and uh, I, I thought about this case for a long time actually and ended up coming up with a plan to start supine, um, start with the ilioinguinal and, and, and attempt to fix the acetabulum first um, and then assess the sacrum radiographically both with fluoro um, and we have uh, access to intraoperative uh, CT. Um, the, the radiographic uh, modality of, of choice is, is really um, not all that critical as, as long as you have access to some form of that. But I was uh, planning to use that to essentially assess the reduction of the sacrum and how close it was. And then um, possible close versus, so with percutaneous fixation versus a prone ORF of the sacrum after I fixed acetabulum was my plan going in. So um, went in, did an ilioinguinal approach, um, fixed the, the anterior column first, um, uh, basically did a, a reduction of the anterior column to the uh, what would otherwise be the intact um, ilium posteriorly and then held it in, in place with some provisional K-wires as you see here on the left 
I find it very hard or very difficult to put a clamp when the, the, the anterior column exits this posteriorly because the abdomen is in the way. And so uh, basically just uh, held a reduction with a, a fair buff clamp and then uh, placed this three five screw through the crest and then placed this plate um, with screws down into the posterior ilium um, for the reduction basically to, to counteract that external rotation deformity of the anterior column. And then um, after that was placed, clamped the anterior and posterior columns together and then place posterior column screw fixation. And then once the posterior column was fixed, then I fixed the acetabulum to the anterior pelvis. So using this intrapelvic plate um, with screws anchored back into the intact ilium and then screws anchored um, into the uh, parasympathetic bone um, on both sides of the symphysis for additional fixation. And there, there was a, um, and I, I noted this preoperatively, there was a, a cortical reduction read on the superior ramus here on the caudal aspect of the anterior column that I felt like I could get pretty close um, and as far as putting the acetabulum back in space. Um, and so I used that um, in order to get that reduction. So Kevin? Yeah. So up to this point, you'd, you'd reduce the anterior column to the, what would be the intact ilium, you reduce the posterior column, but, but now you're fixing across your ramus fracture with your sacrum still displaced. That's correct, yep. Yeah. Any thought about just stopping with your articular reduction and then moving on to the pelvic ring, to the posterior pelvic ring? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, I, and I considered that. Um, what I was a little bit um, concerned about was uh, I was trying to get the rotation back and I felt like um, reattaching the acetabulum to a more anatomic position anteriorly would correct any rotation that I had in the right hemipelvis with the acetabulum fixed. And I felt like if I did that, then I could potentially pull traction through, um, through the hip and pull the sacrum back down to more anatomic position and, and the rotation would be closer um, than it would otherwise be if, if, this, if the anterior ring wasn't fixed. And these plates are, are fairly, fairly malleable. Um, and so I felt like I had enough play through the plate that um, I could adjust it um, as needed. That was my initial thought anyway. Okay. And so um, after I fixed the front of the ring, um, I then I assessed the back and as you can see, uh, the right hemipelvis is still cranially displaced um, quite significantly. And I put them, uh, I put them in, I think it was about uh, 20 to 25 pounds of distal femoral traction. And I actually pulled the sacrum down quite nicely. Um, and I just did these, um, these red lines here, um, just so you can see a little bit better because it's hard to appreciate on these floral films. Um, we got an inlet view. The inlet view looked, looked uh, I thought, pretty good. I mean, it looked like things were lining up pretty well. And then um, I actually did an intraoperative spin at this point, and I don't have the images in here just because um, the images on our intraoperative um, CT scan just save the axials, which um, in the OR, I manipulate the images to get um, direct axials, coronals, and sagittals. Um, and so th those are the images that are actually more useful, but it doesn't typically save those. And so um, I actually adjusted it once and then uh, um, spun the patient again. And I thought the, the reduction actually looked pretty good on the intraoperative CT scan. So then I elected to place a, uh, a transiliac transsacral screw I'm at the S2 level. And I guess at this point, you know the sacrum's uh, distracted a little bit. I'm curious to get um, people's opinions on um, compression at this point. You know, I'm obviously put in a, a, a transilia or a, a partially threaded transiliac transsacral screw here. And um, um, I did end up compressing through this fracture, but I'm curious as to uh, what other people's thoughts are on something like that. Yeah, why don't, we, why don't we hear from John and then from uh, Mike uh, Stover on uh, compressing sacral fractures with a closed reduction. Yeah, I think you, you have to get some sort of compression. Um, otherwise, you're going to be locking in a fixed gap. And I think um, you can use, you know, preoperatively, you can do a lot of templating in terms of your anticipated screw length. You know, you have an intact side to build back to. If you measure back to the midline, you get a sense of, you know, what, double that would be to kind of get your real screw length. And so when you measure that interoperably, you can get a sense of, hey, this is going to be, you know, 10 millimeters longer. So I can, I'm going to compress and add 10 or take off 10, whatever your sequence is going to be, but it'll give you a good um, kind of indirect way to build to what your length should be. Um, but I do think you do have to get some compression. And I think if you get the reduction, which looks pretty good with what Kevin's shown, I think that's going to be a safe compression. Mike Stover. Is compression always safe in uh, common and sacral fractures? I don't know if it's always safe. I don't think I'd be able to say that, but I do think it's necessary. So um, a lot of us have 
argue that's one of the reasons to do open reduction of sac sacral fractures because you can usually get an area of a read of a reduction despite a lot of fragmentation and you can follow the compression along that uh, region as you tighten the screw down. I, uh, I haven't went as fancy as uh, measuring the other side to the uh, midline to uh, take a guess at my screw length. I think that's a great idea. I typically just use a very expensive clamp, which is the first screw that goes in that ends up too long, and then I change it out. All right, Kevin. And so then I placed a, um, he didn't have a corridor for a trans like transsacral screw at the S1 level, so I placed an iliosacral screw. And I guess the question is now um, is, is whether or not this is enough fixation um, for that sacral fracture. Um, one trans like transsacral screw, then one iliosacral screw that um, goes a, a little, that's where the fracture line is basically in the middle of the screw. Um, I didn't personally think this was enough fixation um, given the amount of displacement. That's kind of one of the things I wanted to emphasize in this talk. I think um, leaving uh, historically, if you basically relying on one trans like transsacral screw for this amount of um, um, displacement with this injury, I think uh, this would probably have a high chance of uh, ultimate, uh, ultimate failure. Um, do you, do you think on that view, on that floral view, are, are you as happy with the position of the right sacral ala and the, it, sort of its cranial position? Maybe that's just one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to tell. On that one view, I do agree. It looks like it might be a little bit cranial. Um, but, uh, but so yeah, I think it's, I think it's, if I, I th on that view, I think it's a little bit high. Yeah, but their, your inlet view came, came together nicely. All righty. So the other thing um, uh, I think worth bringing up is, uh, is there anything to do about this now? Um, it's a, kind of a small, um, somewhat peripheral po poster wall fragment, but it's more displaced now than it, than it was um, preoperatively. And then with the reduction, reduction of the sacrum, um, is this now something to, uh, to try to reduce? Um, I, I tried to reduce it from the front and was uh, rather unsuccessful. Um, I think it's sometimes difficult to, um, especially with a piece this small that doesn't have um, some cortical bone extending up the lateral ilium to, to get to accurately place the screw in a piece this small. Um, curious what other people's thoughts are. What do you think, Keith? This is a pretty unusual posterior wall fracture in terms of its size and morphology to have with an associated bolt golem, isn't it? Yeah, it's always a little disturbing when it's uh, displacement secondarily is worse than primary to sort of makes you think that maybe um, you're not quite as accurate as you thought. But you could barely see it on the first axial. So I think before I did anything, uh, I would get a new CT. I don't think I would base that on an intraoperative spin, but uh, I'm not a big believer in that, even though we have it. But um, I'd get a new CT. If the area of involvement is small, um, I'd have to look at uh, how much intact adjacent um, roof there is, as well as the inferior exit. Then you have to make a judgment call. Um, this isn't the typical kind of um, wall fracture you'd subject to an EUA. Uh, so I, I would defer until I had another study. And uh, going back to what I mentioned earlier um, about um, not kind of uh, boxing yourself out for future fixation, um, I didn't. I did not think that this was enough fixation for the sacral fracture, and I'm basically um, intraoperatively felt that well, I was probably going to need to have one of my spine colleagues back this up with lumbopelvic fixation. So I think it's important to get this view. Um, this um, operator outlet view to make sure you do have a pathway for an iliac bolt um, despite all of your hardware that you placed because it's and those bolts are rather large and if you if you have screws that go down the central aspect of this pathway um, then it makes it very hard to place an iliac bolt um, um, on the right side of the hemi pelvis so i think it's important to get this view likewise if you're going to do the acetabulum anteriorly and then flip prone for the sacrum, you have to get a lateral of the sacrum to make sure that you are not blocking the pathway for your transiliac transsacral screw at the S2 level with one of your screws that goes through your plate that's into the intact ilium. Um, so those two things are, are ways not to, not to hose yourself. So these are the post-operative x-rays, post-operative AP, I should say. And I did get a post-operative CT scan. 
as you can see, the sacrum's not perfect, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty close and we confirm safe hardware placement of both the, the iliosacral screw at S1 and then also the transiliac transsacral screw at S2. And then we go further to caudal down to the acetabulum. And you can see that posterior wall that's residually displaced. A little bit of gap there peripherally. And the anterior and posterior column components um, seem to uh, be closed down nicely and sealed well, other than displacement of that residual posterior wall. So what criteria on this CT did you use to decide whether or not that posterior wall needed intervention or not? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a good question. Um, I elected not to go after the posterior wall and elected to leave it. Um, I felt that it was uh, small peripheral. Um, and again, it's a little bit atypical for a both com. Usually these are more avulsion type injuries and don't lead necessarily um, to hip instability. Um, so I felt like it was small enough that, uh, from, from my perspective, it didn't necessarily need fixation. Would anybody else have gone back and done another approach and fixed it? Anybody want to chime in on that one? Probably. I this would. Is the AP or the post-op AP? I think the challenge now is fitting it in. So just looking at the CT, I, a little concerned about maybe just a little external rotation of the uh, ilium, but you know whether or not it's going to fit in. I've I've done it before, and I can tell you that it's really not very satisfying when you go back there and it doesn't fit in perfectly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And these are just a selected cuts of the, the sacrum. I'm showing the ultimate um, reduction of the sacrum. This is just a 3D, I'm kind of giving a better, a little bit of a better appreciation despite all the scatter of where the sacrum's kind of sitting in space. So I think it's probably just a little bit cranially, residually cranially displaced as a Mark was referring to. These are just selected cuts of the acetabulum. And Mark and Kevin, if I could just ask a question about the posterior wall, would anybody think there's any benefit to doing an EUA like we would for a more standard posterior wall, even though I get it, this isn't a, a standard uh, associated with a, a, an associated both column. It's more of a tension failure usually, but is there any role for an examination under anesthesia to do any sort of dynamic instability? I think that's a good question. Um, I, di I didn't think there was in this case um, for the very reason you, you mentioned, um, just because um, uh, these typically are tension failures. Um, I, did I didn't really feel like he had a dysplastic hip um, and he had uh, uh, good coverage of his dome. So um, I like that not to do that here, um, but I, I think that's a very reasonable question. But I'm curious as to whether anybody else would have done that. On the AP, it looks like he's, he's not retroverted as far as the native anatomy or secondarily. The thing that is bothersome is the postural superior location. So I think everybody's had those cases that are associated with a dislocation in the same location, which look relatively innocuous, but were then treated by somebody non-operatively and re led to recurrent instability, and then uh, you've got problems. So, um, even though it's a long ways through normal anatomy to get there. I, I, how old is he? Uh, he's 40. He's a young guy. So um, I, I agree with Mike. I probably would have gone after it. But again, sorry, he, he's a little older than that. I'm sorry, I missed the book. He's in his 50s. But what, what's the downside of going after it? Yeah. Good question, yeah. You know, the downside is the second surgical approach and the potential complications associated with that. But, uh, but and then, and, and also, Mike, as you said, although this, uh, the reduction in the anterior and posterior columns to each other look, looks quite nice on all the imaging that we've seen. But, um, you know, we've all seen the situation where the reason the posterior wall looks more displaced is because the reduction of the anterior to the posterior column is, 
extruding the posterior wall because the because the reduction is not accurate. I, I don't know. I don't think that's the case here, but it's a uh, it's really distressing to do a secondary coker and realize the reason you can't put the wall back in is because you got to start over. Yeah, I've been there. So this guy ended up going um, back to the operating room. Um, really, it was between two and three weeks postoperatively. He actually developed a significant ileus um, and had a, a bowel perforation um, postoperatively um, on postoperative day, like five or six. And uh, he was um, basically NPO and on TPN and significantly nutritionally deplete um, for a while um, after that and actually um, dehissed part of all of his wounds um, that, that were slow to heal. Um, but then they went in and uh, did, uh, my spine partner went in and did percutaneous lumbopelvic fixation on the right side um, for further stability. And here he is uh, about a year out. Um, he's got a little bit of arthritis in his hip, but uh, his hip doesn't really bother him. Um, it's actually his plateau that's really driving his outcome on his right leg because his plateau was pretty bad. Um, but if you look closely at these images, um, it looks like he has broke his iliac bolt um, from its attachment um, on the uh, um, on, on the rod, and so my spine partner is uh, planning to take out his hardware um, sometime in the near future. Is uh, is his sacrum united? Um, I think it is. Um, I, I think it is united. I haven't um, repeated a CT scan, um, but um, uh, but he's not really having any any pain uh, around his hip or pelvis. He's got some weakness, but um, otherwise, I'm not really having any discomfort. No, that's a great case. And then uh, just to just review the educational points, I think it's just important to have a sequence strategy. We talked about multiple strategies in this case. Um, I think multiple different um, different types of strategies would have, would have likely been successful. You gotta make sure you have adequate fixation. Last thing you want is for the sacrum to fail, um, given how um, unstable it was and how displaced it was initially. And you wanna make sure you have a contingency plan. Um, and then as far as what I would do differently, I think um, uh, looking back at this case, um, I might've done something with the poster wall um, for one. Um, if uh, it would have probably been a little bit more difficult for me to um, accept a closed reduction intra intraoperatively and without an intraoperative CT scan, um, I do think that from, um, from my perspective is helpful um, in assuring that, that things are close because sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to appreciate on x-ray. And um, I wish I would have coordinated a spine fixation a little bit earlier um, just because um, we waited a few days and uh, kind of got behind the eight ball with him um, getting pretty sick and being in the ICU for a while. So his spine fixation was a little bit delayed, um, which caused a little bit of stress as far as whether or not his sacrum is going to displace. But ultimately, I think he's had a, a pretty reasonable outcome for his uh, pelvic ring and his uh, astagmal. Sorry, somehow I lost my Zoom window there. Keith, you want to uh, you want to bring up your case here? Thanks, Kevin. That, that, was, a, that was a great case. Yeah, thank you. Okay, can you see it? Mark, everybody? Yep. Okay. Um, so this is a 22 year old. Um, I never really got the full story with this as you'll see in a minute. Um, but he was uh, running from a robbery scene where he had um, shot somebody, fortunately not lethally, and um, was accidentally or not accidentally hit by the police cruiser and then dragged for X, X feet. And it's mid morning, so they started early. And these are his other injuries, which are sort of jumping ahead a bit. He had a knee dislocation with no vascular injury, a relatively straightforward C3 distal femur on the opposite side, a grade one liver lack, <clears throat> and a transient loss of consciousness, but his TCS was 14 in the ED. And his. Injury film was this. And he's awake and talking in the emergency room. And that's our typical from x-ray, which was then repeated and then looked like this. This happened about uh, three blocks from the ED and um, he did not have any kind of binder applied. At this point, he's awake and talking, but tachycardic and has borderline hypertension. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the diagnosis here because I think this diagnoses are relatively straightforward. Um, 
This is the 3D of his injury. So he has a left-sided complete sacral act dislocation, and he has, in addition to pulling off the transverse process, knocked off the posterior part of the ala, ipsilateral, rami, and pubic body, contralateral, juxtatecal, transverse acetabular fracture, and then a transiliac injury, which enters the anterior part of the sacral actually. And this is a single cut showing the uh, extent of the involvement, so essentially almost sparing the SI joint as far as articular involvement on the right side. And so we have this constellation of injuries. We just delineated. And after resuscitation, this is where he stands. He remarkably was relatively easily resuscitated. He got three units of PAC cells, uh, and a hemoglobin of 10.1, a lactate of 3.2. At this point, he's hemodynamically stable. His head CT is negative, and they're gonna manage his liver lack non-operatively. And, and this is that rare case where it's mid to late afternoon and you're cleared for a short procedure. And, they, and short by them is less than two hours. So these are the considerations that I was uh, thinking about. Number one was just the duration of the procedure for stage one. And then these are the recurring themes we keep seeing over and over, and that is the impact of the pelvic ring interventions on the acetabular injury. So with that preamble and a two hour time window, What's our surgical plan as far as the prime first stage? He's got a magic two hour first stage here. Stover, anything you'd, you'd try and uh, pick off in that time frame? I think if anybody can't do something in two hours, it'd be Keith and then me. So <laughs> I that, I that, their normal window would have been uh, four hours, but for me, they made it too, just so I could make it. Because they knew you're going to make it for. But uh, I would certainly, if I have a short period of time to take care of this, I would probably uh, attempt a closed reduction and percutaneous fixation of left SI joint. I don't think that that will really have any implications on the transverse fracture on the other side because of the symphysial disruption in the front and the parasympathial and the rami fractures. And then I would like to get the uh, posterior pelvic ring put together on the right, but I don't think I could do that within the two hour span. So I would at least get the, uh, get the left SI joint taken care of. I don't want to approach the anterior pelvis because that will definitely set the uh, issues with the uh, acetabular fracture on the right. Uh, so my priorities would be left SI joint, right SI joint fracture dislocation, and then the transverse has to have a fracture, and then finally the anterior pelvic ring. If, uh, if, the, if the patient was fully cleared for definitive management, would you go prone with a bilateral open posterior pelvic ring and a, and a coker? Uh, yeah, I would definitely go prone. Uh, the question is whether or not I would try to do the SI joint still closed with some kind of pelvic stabilization device and pull that down uh, to the intact ilium on the contralateral side and the sac and the femur just to secure the patient with a pelvic stabilizer and try to do it closed. And then, because uh, Keith did mention he had some abrasions on his backside too, so I don't know what those the status of those are. But yes, I'd try to knock out the posterior pelvic ring with the first stage. Yeah, so he, he does have fairly extensive road rash, sort of from L2 all the way down to mid buttock on both sides. But fortunately, associated with that, he does not appear to have a closely gloving injury, at least on exam. Um, and so those are the considerations. Anything else? And any of the other faculty uh, try something different? Would you try a 
closed reduction of the SI fracture dislocation on the right side. All right, no takers there. So it looks like we're, uh, we're going maximally perhaps for the contralateral SI joint where the uh, presence of the symphysis dislocation and the rami fractures protect you from that having an effect on your transverse reduction. Okay, so um, the first, the first uh, hour was uh, spanning fixators for both knees. And then I was able to pull through the fixator on this side it only required about 15 pounds of force for, uh, for traction and flexion. The problem being that reading this is because of this floating portion of the ala. Um, so we have preoperative verified that we have room for S1 and S2 screws. And screw number one, and then two drill bits for screw number two and the end of stage one. So that's where we are after spanning fixators and uh, percutaneous screws on the left side. You have an AP pelvis following that stage? Actually, I don't, you won't, you're gonna have to wait to see it in a bit. So it, it is, it is, not perfect, as you'll see, but it's close. Any, uh, any way of controlling the synthesis as well at this point? Probably not, right? Not. Well, I mean, in, in reality, um, on the left side, you have two connecting links. You got a pubic body and rami fractures, and then you have a wide symphysial dislocation. So. Um, that does prove to be a problem going forward, for sure. And so the question is then, this is a 22-year-old, uh, great bone. Um, and I have frequently seen other types of fixation for this. I'd be interested to see what the panel thinks about what the need for so-called transiliac fixation as a second point of fixation in the situation. Bill, any- uh, so You also were planning for post-operative traction for the right side, Keith? Yeah, I'm, I'm, he's in traction through his frame on the right side. You yeah, I think, I think the question is the, the stability of the fixation. I think this looks like stable fixation to me. I. I think that the S2 uh, screws generally don't have as good a purchase, so I might have attempted to put two in the S1 corridor, but I, I would feel comfortable with the stability of, of the fixation on the left side. I, I can't really judge the reduction quality, but just in terms of the question, is the screw fixation enough? I think the answer is yes. And I think it does also leave you uh, corridors for bone fixation because you know you're gonna be dealing with the right SI joint fracture dislocation as well. So I like the fact that the screws are slightly short of the maximal length that you could use. I don't think it needs transiliac fixation. Thank you. Okay, so he, he, for reasons which were not entirely clear, he had kind of a difficult post-operative course, had a, a difficult time extubating him, and was never really sure what was going on. So it took two days to be cleared for definitive surgery. And this is where I felt I was at that point. So the left SI was close, but not anatomic, and I didn't feel that I could improve it significantly with even with an open reduction that the chances of an anatomic fit reduction of the transiliac disruption involving the SI joint in my hands is essentially zero and if we put those two together then reduction of the symphysis um, is essentially uh, not going to help in any significant way and to me, the posture approach for the uh, transverse was largely taken away 
um, from my viewpoint, uh, on a soft tissue viewpoint, as well as the lack of a symposial hinge. So with those, now you can certainly quarrel with any or all of those, I'd be interested, but um, just uh, tell us where we're gonna go from here. So Keith, your, your concern about the inability to get a perfect restoration of the, of the transiliac disruption in the face of a symphysis dislocation, does it, I mean, is it less critical there since it shouldn't affect your transverse? It will make the symphysis reduction, of course, imperfect though, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it, <clears throat> the goal here for the transverse is to restore an, a physiologic symphyseal hinge, which I'm not sure you can do surgically. Um, and therein lies one of the difficulties because I've already boxed myself in because I've convinced myself that I need an anterior approach for the transverse, which is not a actually oriented transverse. It's more oblique sagittal, which is already a problem. Um, and so the question is, how am I going to manage the, the known deformities with, which we're going to encounter with the, tra with the transverse component? Any thoughts? Okay, why don't you? Okay, we'll go ahead. So we started anterior leoguinal um, essentially with the intercalary fragment was um, very difficult to read completely. So I'm really reading this reduction at the sacroiliac joint with a very small area of articular surface to go by. So this plate is initially just a clamp. We have a shant screw here for rotational control. And then my initial plan was just to leave this semi-flexible and then get my best reduction possible of the transverse by controlling the synthesis. So I went ahead at this point. So um, we have uh, control of the pubic body on that side through with a vapor clamp, small vapor clamp. Uh, that's through the modified, if you will, third window and the asymmetric reduction aid through the first window and then assessing it through the first and second windows. And um, and unfortunately, I mean, we can see already what the problem is going to be because this interdigitation along the pelvic brim under direct visualization and palpation is virtually perfect. But we can see through here that there is this retroastabular gap. And my assumption was that by repositioning the clamp, um, that we would ultimately be able to manage this. However, as we know, this obliquity is not well set up for anterior to posterior fixation. So uh, I started with that. I thought that if we could lag in the anterior portion of this cuputic segment, so there's the obturator oblique, there's the iliac oblique, and this is the percutaneous anterior column screws that were put in. And then there was adjustment in the posterior column clamp. And then starting as far lateral as I could to anterior to posterior screws. And these were lag screws. I assumed that I, I had it captured anteriorly with the clamp and that I could use that as a way to close the retroastabular gap. As it turns out, that was a false assumption. I think, uh, I think we've all been there. I certainly have struggled with this problem more times than I care to remember. And I have yet to come up with a solution for it. So, so I thought about, I mean, I definitely could have put a small inf infrapectineal plate in here, but that doesn't really control it at this level. And so I, I was, you know, I was extremely frustrated at this point. I made a bad judgment call because I fixed the distal femur first. So we were already a number of hours into the case at this point. 
And, um, and my only thought was that the only anatomic components of this pelvic ring at this point are the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments. And so given the fact that the anometer bone was laterally rotated, even though I couldn't demonstrate it on my views, that I felt that perhaps I had a soft tissue hinge that was Latin, making it impossible for me to actually laterally rotate the posterior column. And I briefly considered uh, sectioning the ischial spine, but then I, I was afraid that I could do that uh, with relatively minimal risk, but I wouldn't be able to get to the uh, sacros uh, tuberous ligament, which was probably more important. So I didn't. Any thoughts on that? I, it's, it, it's certainly an interesting idea, but I, I think that, you know, it's, you, you won't know if it has any effect yeah. <laughs> until, you, until you've gone fairly far down that, that, down that rabbit hole. Okay, because the only thing that I've done uh, on one occasion was, in, in a case similar to the one that Phil showed last week, where it's a contralateral SI, uh, opposite of transverse and the, SI, and the SI joint reduction looks good, but the symphysis still isn't where it belonged as I have on one occasion out of desperation section the symphysis so I had better control of the scripture segment. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we so probably that's, where, that's where we were. And we probably should have just stayed there, but I thought that we would do something anterior. I was fairly confident with the fixation, but I put a in, in situ symphysial plate on, which conceptually doesn't really offer much. And then we end up with that final construct intraoperatively. And these are his images. Um, at about three and a half weeks. He was in the hospital. He had a very stormy post-op course. It turns out that he transected one ureter. And so he had a, uh, an abdomen full of urine, got to end up with a secondary sub, uh, subhepatic abscess and got his belly explored and all kinds of other things. And I actually thought about going back and dealing with this posteriorly, because I thought this fixation was flexible enough that I could do it, but uh, the opportunity never presented itself. Keith, now that uh, you have the synthesis fixed, though, do you think that's still an option? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't think this fixation would have, I mean, these are, this is a four to five millimeter gap hanging on this, and I think it probably would have been able to pull that around. I don't know, I, I don't have that experience in this construct. But the inlet actually shows the deformity the, the worst. So it's pretty well centered here, but you can see this component. This is, at, I think, three and a half weeks just before he went to the prison infirmatory. Um, and that was his final follow up because he was uh, never seen again. So I, I always want to know what I would have done differently. Um, and I think what I would have done differently on this, in this situation is I would have left the synthesis probably alone at this point. I would have fixed the anterior column, the anterior part of the your pubic segment first, and I would have gone prone for the posterior part of the your pubic segment, because I think a lot more powerful reduction aids from the, from the posterior approach. And I'd like to think at least that, that I would have been successful with that. So the question is that, uh, you know, if the posterior soft tissues were questionable early, I mean, how patient can you be to wait? I don't know. I mean, it, this is like when you're a, in the front. When you're this, in the front. Okay, go ahead. Well, I mean, I had the op. I, I mean, I could have operated up to three weeks. I mean, it was a classic sort of bicycle road rash. He had very superficial erosions, and I have operated through that before just by debriding the, the superficial escars and then doing dual prep. So I think that would have been possible. Um, 
But I think, Mike, your, your question is that, you know, a, after you wait a period of time and you get some callus around the rami or at the symphysis and your anterior column component of the transverse is starting to unite, like at, at what point is it too late to add a second approach uh, posteriorly? Is that your... Yeah, I, I mean, the one thing I would consider, though, is that if you're going to wait on the posterior soft tissues is that maybe you'd have to stage the anterior part to clean it out again and then do your posterior approach for the transverse and for the SI fracture dislocation. I think with the symphysis unfixed and the, and the rami unfixed, you probably have a longer window maybe than, uh, you know, than, than by stiffening the anterior ring with the symphyseal fixation. But I think that the, you know, the, the take home or do you have the, yeah, right. Yeah, so I mean, these, the, Phil hit all these points last week, but um, I mean, the symphyseal hinge for the ischopubic segment is critical. The problem is to make putting that in a space spatially, which is anatomic, and, uh, and then these issues. And then, I mean, I'm, it's really difficult to try to, to come up with general principles for concomitant you know, pelvis nastagra surgeries, but I mean, it's rare for us to get a contralateral hemipelvis posterior ring injury anatomic enough to put the symphysis back in an anatomic position. And so if we can't do that, then we're left with the necessity to exploit residual instability on the side that we're working with with the acetabular fracture. And in this case, I didn't really have the symphyseal uh, disruption because um, I didn't. I had a symphyseal, symphyseal disruption, which theoretically should have made it easier. I, when I first looked at this, I figured I had a tremendous amount of slop in the system. And so I, I naively, even despite the many years at this point that I already spent doing this, that the transverse was going to be relatively straightforward. Um, and in fact, I think the things that made it difficult were, again, just a, compo a compounding malreduction of the ipsilateral sacroiliac joint slash transiliac disruption. Um, and I'm, I'm still not sure, uh, and if I had to do over again with pristine soft tissues, I would have fixed the transiliac disruption and then gone prone for the transverse because it was a relatively straightforward um, pattern for a prone approach. Uh, Steve or, uh, or Dave, any uh, questions from the participants you want to bring up? I think they've all been answered, Mark. I think we could probably right. uh, kind of move on. Okay, then um, uh, actually you can unshare that, Keith, or or not, if you wish. Um, that uh, that brings us to the conclusion of this uh, this evening's portion. And so, um, really, thank you all for for joining in uh, with us for this uh, for this case discussion, and hope it was uh, worthwhile. And we, um, you know, we look forward to virtually seeing you again on uh, Saturday morning here uh, in a couple of days when we are, are going to continue with the final week of the of the essentials course uh, and we'll be looking at special problems and complications. So the evaluation questions are going to come up for this evening's uh, session and uh, please answer them and then uh, join us again on Saturday and thank you very much for your your time and your attention. <laughs>